Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell if you enjoy this episode. Forty-five years ago, a man and woman were brutally murdered on a dirt frontage road in Sumter County, South Carolina. For more than four decades, the identities of the victims have remained a mystery, and for two families, the truth of what became of their loved ones was always just out of reach. That all changed last month in January of 2021. During a press conference, members of the Sumter County Sheriff's Office announced that in conjunction with a local citizen investigator and the DNA Doe Project, they have finally identified the victims who have laid beneath stones marked male unknown and female unknown at Bethel United Methodist Cemetery in Sumter County since a year after their murders. James Paul Fruind and Pamela Mae Buckley both disappeared in December of 1975. Eight months later, they were found murdered along the narrow Locklair Road, not far from Interstate 95. Despite a large-scale investigation and a determination from then-Sheriff I. Bird Parnell, the case has gone unsolved all these years. However, now that James and Pam have been identified, Investigators are focused on identifying their elusive killer also. This is Trace Evidence Case Update, Episode Number 118, The Sumter County Does. Welcome to this Trace Evidence Update episode. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. While the identities of James Fruind and Pamela Buckley were revealed last month, Usually, I release updates fairly quickly, but I wanted to ensure their families had time to process this news and that I was able to put together as much information as I could about their lives leading up to that tragic day in August of 1976. Without further ado, let's move into the case update. It was just before sunrise on the morning of Monday, August 9th, 1976, when truck driver Martin Durant pulled over along South Carolina's Highway 341, where it met Lock Lair Road, a narrow dirt road which ran parallel to nearby Interstate 95. Not too far away, Durant could just make out two shapes lying near the side of the road. It was 6.20 a.m., and while the horizon had begun to brighten, it was still difficult to see much along the unlit rural road, and the sun wouldn't be up for another 15 minutes. Curious, Durant slowly strode towards the shapes, kicking up light clouds of dirt as he closed the gap. With each step, the shapes were becoming more and more clear. The curiosity which had urged Durant forward was slowly being overcome by the hesitant tingle, which had begun as a lump in his throat but was now crawling up the back of his neck. It wasn't until he got close enough to see that he fully understood where that haunting sensation had come from. As Durant's eyes began adjusting to the pre-dawn light, the shapes came sharply into focus. Hair, eyes, hands. Nearly choking on his breath, Durant turned and ran back towards his truck, prying open the door and immediately reaching for his CB radio. He called out for assistance and was answered by Charles Graham, a clerk in a nearby store that Durant stopped at during long hauls. It was Graham who contacted police, and within 15 minutes, deputies from the Sumter County Sheriff's Office found the full horror of the scene illuminated by the morning sun. There were two bodies, a man and a woman. The male had shoulder-length brown hair and an olive complexion. He was lying on his back, right leg bent in a figure four with the ankle of his left leg crossing that of his right. His right arm was bent, lying across his stomach, while his left extended away at a slight angle. His head was cocked to the left, and his brown eyes stared blankly towards the woman nearby. Reddish-brown hair fell down the back of her head, touching the curled fingertips of her right hand. She, too, was lying on her back with her feet jutting slightly off the edge of the road and into the main dirt path. Her head was also facing to the left, hazel eyes locked open with a blank stare. 
Her chin was tilted upward. Her mouth hung open as though she was silently screaming towards the sky. It was apparent from the first look that they were both dead. The method by which they were murdered was the same for both of them. Three gunshots in total. At the time, and up until a recent press conference, it had been reported that each had been shot through the throat. However, that has now been corrected, and it's been said each sustained a shot to the head with entry and exit wounds visible, as well as shots to the upper torso. Given the rural location and the emptiness of the road, investigators theorized the killer had planned to take them further down into the wilderness, but when he found the roadway blocked by fences belonging to a tobacco farm, he decided to commit the murders right there, before driving back onto the pavement and disappearing into the darkness. Neither victim had any identification, and so investigators hoped to identify them before tackling the more challenging question of who might have committed such a violent and heinous crime. They had no way of knowing that the victim's identities would be nearly as elusive as that of the killer. They were standing on the precipice of what would become one of the most haunting and stubborn mysteries in the past 50 years. Investigators would eventually discover the murder weapon, which allowed them to zero in on a suspect, though there was never an arrest or charge filed. That man, Lonnie George Henry, who had been found in possession of the revolver which had killed the man and woman, died just six years later at the age of 63, taking what he knew with him to the grave. In August of 1977, after a year of trying to identify them or locate relatives, the man and woman were given a funeral and laid to rest in Bethel United Methodist Cemetery in Oswego, South Carolina. More than 200 mourners attended to pay their respects to the unidentified pair who would rest beneath stones inscribed as unknown male and unknown female. They would become known as Jane and Jock Doe, with the latter moniker having been assigned based on information from a man who claimed to have met the two prior to their deaths. The man wore a ring with the initials JPF, and so Jock worked for that time. For more than 40 years, the mystery of Jane and Jock captured the attention of investigators, both professional and amateur, who hoped that unlocking the secret of their lives might lead them closer to revealing the truth about their deaths. Many who had worked the case from day one went to their graves never knowing who they were, let alone who killed them and why. Over the years, DNA technology has been advancing at a rapid rate, and many formerly unidentified victims have had their names restored. In June of 2019, the Sumter County Sheriff's Office was contacted by Matt McDaniels, a citizen investigator and researcher who had followed the case and worked it for eight years. McDaniel put the sheriff's office in touch with the DNA Doe Project. Then the news broke. Jane and Jock had finally been identified. At a press conference on January 21st, 2021, the Sumter County Sheriff's Office and DNA Doe Project confirmed the victims as 30-year-old James Paul Fruind, who had gone missing out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania on December 26, 1975, and 25-year-old Pamela May Buckley, who had disappeared from Colorado Springs, Colorado, much like James, in December of 1975. James Paul Fruind was born on September 16, 1946, to parents Adam Wendelin Fruind and Loletta Grace Brandenburg in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. James lived with his parents at 22 Prescott Street in the town of Leominster for a few years, before the family moved to Pennsylvania, Adam's home state, where they moved into an end row home at 324 South Marshall Street in the city of Lancaster. James was an only child and went on to attend McCaskey High School, where he belonged to several clubs, including English Study, Baseball, and Pinochle. James played junior varsity football and baseball and was planning on becoming an accountant, according to the 1964 yearbook in which his nickname is listed as J.P. James went on to graduate in 1964, and while he may have initially considered accounting, his future would take a sharp turn in July, when he enlisted in the Army. According to the Intelligencer Journal, James underwent basic training at Fort Knox, and six months later in February of 65, 
He completed a 14-week automotive repair course at the Army Ordnance Proving Ground in Maryland. That same month, James became engaged to a woman he had gone to high school with. While her name is publicly available, I'm choosing not to give it here in order to respect her privacy. The couple married on Saturday, December 11th, 1965, and at the time, James was noted as serving in the Army and being stationed in Bremerhaven, Germany. The next year, James and his family received a tragic blow when his father suddenly passed away. On Saturday, November 5th, Adam left his job at John S. Groff, where he was employed as a car salesman because he wasn't feeling well. Shortly after arriving home, the paramedics were called and Adam was rushed to the hospital, but passed away not long after arrival. His death was ruled to have been due to a heart attack. He was just 49 years old. Two years later, in December of 1967, James' mother remarried. According to several local reports, a few years later in 1970, James and his wife welcomed their first child. At the time, their address was listed as being on Holly Drive in Leola. Despite the joyousness of the occasion, the marriage seemed to be devolving into a state of disrepair, and in September of 71, James filed for divorce. At the time, James was 25 years old and living in an apartment on West Walnut Street, while his soon-to-be ex-wife was listed at the couple's previous Holly Drive address in the Intelligencer Journal's divorce notification. Details are somewhat sketchy over the next few years, though there is at least one news article which states James would go on to have a second child after his divorce. Much of that comes out of an October 1974 article where James was announced as being charged with non-payment of child support though the charges were dropped when he caught up on payments. This article was published less than two years before James would be found murdered, and for the most part, between October of 74 and the murders in August of 76, James doesn't appear in the public record. What we do know now is the last time family reported having contact with James was on Christmas in 1975. In October of 1985, the Intelligencer Journal posted a legal notice about an upcoming hearing. This hearing came as the result of a petition being filed in, quote, the Court of Common Pleas of Lancaster County Orphans Court Division, end quote. This appears to have been a petition to have James legally declared deceased due to no one having had contact with him for nearly 10 years. A second petition for the same purpose can be found in 1988, this one reportedly filed by James' ex-wife, according to the Lancaster New Era. Sadly, James' mother passed away on October 22, 2004 at the age of 77, never knowing what became of her only son. Where James went or why still remains unclear. What exactly occurred over the eight months between his last sighting and the double murder will, hopefully, be answered in the coming months. Many reporters and online sleuths are working overtime to try and fill in all the blanks, and it's more likely than not that at some point, the mystery of James' travels will be discovered. There is, of course, the mystery of Pamela Buckley as well. Pamela May Buckley was born on December 16, 1951, to parents Shirley May Hanley and Robert John Buckley in Redwood City, Minnesota. Pam was the Buckley's third child, having two older brothers at the time of her birth and later two younger sisters. Pam attended Redwood Falls High School, where over the course of four years, she belonged to different clubs and organizations. Primarily, she was a member of the school choir and Spanish club over the majority of her high school career. Her senior yearbook lists her as also belonging to the drama club and notes that she was a homecoming queen candidate. It's quite clear that Pam had a love of music, and that would play a major role in her future beginning with her high school graduation in 1970. According to the Redwood Falls Gazette, Pam was chosen to be Snow Queen in February of 1970. The selection was made by the Redwood Falls JCs, a community volunteer group that in part organized community festivals and fundraisers. While Pam apparently accepted the title of Snow Queen, her interests would steer her in another direction. She was being prepped to become Miss Redwood Falls in 1971, but instead 
Pam decided to abdicate the throne, so to speak, wanting instead to go on a tour of the West Coast with a folk trio she sang for called Sunlending, not to be confused with an 80s rock foursome of the same name. Tracking Sunlending can be somewhat complicated, but I found more than 20 mentions of the trio between late 1970 and mid-1972. In just one of those articles from the Minneapolis Star Tribune in December of 70, Sun Lending is described as a three-person group composed of John Daly, Anthony Matthews, and Pamela Buckley. Every other mention is simply of the band's name, and following through chronologically, we can see the trio performed in Minnesota, South Dakota, New Mexico, and Colorado. It seems like the group may have gone through different iterations, as in some news articles, you can find John Daly and Anthony Matthews being listed as formerly of Sun Lending. Things would change for Pam as well. In October of 1972, she got married and was listed as living in Manitou Springs in El Paso County, Colorado. The man she married was a few years older than her at the time, though apparently had a love of music which continues to this day. I found several legal documents tying him to finances related to a group called the Colorado Springs Music Company. Pam's husband, whose name I'm leaving out to protect his privacy, had been married at least once before. Public records show him as getting divorced in May of 1970. Interestingly, Pam's middle name is spelled differently on her marriage license, while her legal middle name is listed as May, M-A-E, on the marriage license and in Pam's own signature, it is spelled M-A-I. Not a lot of information is known about Pam's time in Colorado, other than she moved from Manitou Springs to Colorado Springs at some point. She apparently was there from at least October of 72 to December of 75, when she was last seen, but in terms of her work or her other activities, little has been discovered. According to the public record, Pam and her husband's divorce was finalized on August 20th, 1976, 11 days after she was murdered alongside James in South Carolina. More than likely, that divorce proceeding was filed sometime in late 75 or early 76, probably around the time of her disappearance. According to several missing persons sites, Pam was reported missing by her family in December of 75. Much like in James' case, there's not yet much information about how Pam came to be in South Carolina in August of 76 or where she may have traveled over the course of the eight months between the last time she was seen and when the double murder occurred. There have been reports that Pam may have left Colorado hitchhiking to the east. Where she met James, what their relationship was, is still very much a mystery. There are those who believe since the two went off the grid in December of 75 that maybe they knew each other beforehand. Others think they met somewhere on the road. Anything's possible at this moment, and there's surely a chance they could have met as early as December of 75 or January of 76, or perhaps as late as days or weeks before they were murdered. It's always amazing to see names restored in doe cases, and the Sumter County does have had to wait a long time for us to learn who they were. However, knowing the names of James Paul Fruind and Pamela Mae Buckley doesn't take us very close to who they were. James was just 30 years old when he was killed, and Pamela was only 25. Their lives were cut short in a moment of brutal violence, and what dreams they may have had or lives they may have gone on to live were erased at the hands of an unknown killer. Both had families, people who cared for them and wondered what might become of them. The families have since been notified, and obviously, they must come to terms with the horror of the truth. While it answers some questions, it leaves others that will hopefully be answered over the course of the current investigation. While there's an excitement and a joy in that James and Pam's identities are finally known, there is also the sadness of their tragic deaths and the hope that they will see justice done. This case is far from closed. During last month's press conference, several new details were brought to light. Firstly, it was reported that there were no gunshots to the throat and that earlier reports were inaccurate. Beyond that, at least one person referred to the murders as execution style. 
Police have not yet determined the nature of the relationship between James and Pam, nor have they discovered where each had traveled between December of 75 and August of 76. Asked about a vehicle, it was said they weren't sure if James or Pam had one, or perhaps caught a ride with the person who later killed them. When asked about the nature of the crime, Sumter County Sheriff Anthony Dennis noted they did not believe there was a connection to any type of serial killer, and rather that this was an isolated incident. He also stated that there are persons of interest who will be interviewed. In Sheriff Dennis's opinion, there are people out there who know more about the murders than they have ever shared, and they're hoping some of those people will come forward. Now that James and Pam have been identified, the homicide investigation is kicking into high gear, and the Sumter County Sheriff's Department has said they will be working the case hard and would likely be working with other law enforcement agencies. One part of this haunting and disturbing mystery has been solved, and I imagine over the course of the next few months, a lot of new information regarding James and Pam will be revealed. However, there's still a killer out there somewhere who has evaded justice for nearly 50 years. If indeed there are living persons of interest, it'll be interesting to see if they have any connections to Lonnie George Henry, who was found in possession of the murder weapon, though he was never directly tied to the murders. For a case which has been open unsolved and very cold for more than four decades, things are beginning to heat up, and hopefully, sooner than later, we will see justice served for James and Pamela. James Paul Fruind and Pamela May Buckley were brutally murdered sometime during the evening hours of Sunday, August 8th, or the early morning hours of Monday, August 9th, 1976, along Locklair Road in Sumter County, South Carolina. Investigators do have persons of interest in this case, though they have made it clear they believe that there are people who know more about the murder than they have shared, possibly including the killer's identity. They're focused on solving this case and making an arrest, but they could use your help. If you have any information about the murders of James Fruind and Pamela Buckley, please contact the Sumter County Sheriff's Office at 803-436-2000. You can also contact Crime Stoppers at 1-888-CRIME-SC. That's 1-888-274-6300. Seven two. This concludes the update for now, though I'm sure a lot of information is going to come out over the course of the next months. Hopefully, sooner than later, we're going to see an arrest and someone will be made to stand trial for this horrible double murder. I want to thank you for listening to this update, and for all of you who have reached out to discuss it with me over the past few weeks. While I thought of doing a short update at the time, I wanted to instead give James and Pam's families time, as well as to ensure I could find more information about their lives and who they actually were. So thank you again for listening, and a big special thank you to anyone who donated to the DNA Doe Project while the DNA research was being done. I hope you'll join me Monday for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.